Okay, during the break, we had a wonderful discussion about politics. The election's not over. George, say what you were going to say again so I can clarify this about Christianity. Go ahead. Oh, uh, push it down, push it down, push it down. Um, I forgot what we were talking about, about that, but um, because my memory is kind of bad. About, about that Jesus represents the superego. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, all I said, I mean, all I'm, all I'm saying is, is, is about life. Um, right. It's about life. It's not a, the the New Testament is not about um, oh Lord Jesus. You know, I, I don't mean to argue and debate. Go ahead, no, arguing's good. Go it's ahead, just about, that's um, good. It's just about you know, it's about life. You know, He came that we may have life. You know, it's not about trying to to follow a pattern or not WWJD. What would Jesus do? Um, is what is Jesus doing? You know, what is he doing? Oh Lord Jesus. You know, oh okay, Amen. Well. It's, it's not. It's not WWJD. It's not what will he do? Okay, he'll cry now, so I better cry. You know? Oh, what do you do? Oh, he'll feel sad right now, so I better feel sad. No, but it, but he's life, and he's in life inside of our spirit. You know, because we have a spirit according to the Bible. Oh Lord Jesus, I mean, he's spirit, and it right. is inside our spirit. But and would you oh, would Lord you Jesus, agree that yeah. he brought a message? Yes. Okay, the message that he brought, everybody's id hates. That's clear according to Freud. Love thy neighbor as thyself, all that stuff. The id doesn't want to hear that. The id wants to go into your neighbor and break into the house and steal everything. That's what Freud says. So I said, I don't agree with that, but this is, this is, okay? So what Freud is going to tell you that feelings, irrational feelings that you have, etc., feelings of anger and hate and this and that, things that don't seem to belong anywhere, they're deep within, they're deep within personality. Let me just show you, let's go back to the PowerPoint, what Freud says happens when you have an Oedipal stage fixation, when you don't re renew it well. Guilt over competitive urges. Because when you compete, because you don't have it well repressed enough, because you're not well enough repressed, you haven't repressed this urge to, with your father, you feel guilty because out it comes and, and out comes this idea that you want to compete with your father. Okay? Apprehension and competition with other men because it reminds you of competition with your father. Now if it's, if you have a, if it's well repressed and if you've got it all done there, then you don't have the apprehension. Problems with intimacy since they evoke Oedipal feelings. This is Freud's explanation of the Don Juan. You know who Don Juan was? The man who went from woman to woman to woman to woman. So women are okay if they're an outlet for your id urges, if it's just to, a cathartic feeling to get this libidinal energy out. But the minute the intimacy comes, woo, up comes this, up comes these Oedipal feelings, these feelings for your mother, and, okay. By the way, I forgot to, we took a comeback to me. Who was Oedipus? Does anybody know? What happened to Oedipus? Who knows the story of Oedipus? You know? Go ahead. Wasn't, didn't he have uh, wax wings and he flew too high? And, that no, else? that's Icarus. Oedipus. <laughs> right. What happened is that when Oedipus was born, his father, his father was told, your son will kill you. So he calls one of his soldiers, he says, take the boy out and kill him. But the soldier, right, uh, a, a, one of the Greek uh, oracles told him that. The soldier felt pity on him, so he gave him to a family to adopt. Okay, this family brought him up, and they didn't tell him he wasn't their natural son. When Oedipus was older, another oracle said, you will kill your father. He thought it was the adopted father, was his real father. He had no idea, so he runs away, and he goes through the series of things in which he becomes a king somewhere, and his kingdom has a war with his father's kingdom. He has no idea it's his father, kills his father, and it was typical in those days, right? Takes the, takes the defeated king's wife for his own. Of course, it was his mother. Later he finds out it's his mother and he pokes his eyes out and all kinds of horrible things. Freud said, this, like the tale of the story of Narcissus, is our own feelings, our own Oedipal fe our own feelings of desires for our mother coming out, but in a safe way you tell like a story. Okay? So what, and he's saying all men have them. And he says what happens is that if you just use women for an outlet for your inner urges, that's fine. Just sex. But, go ahead. 
Um, what happens in this stage if the boy doesn't have a father oh, that's, that's a around? People said, wait a minute here. What about boys who don't have fathers? By the way, in the old days, quote, quote, old days, um, usually somebody else would fill in, a grandfather or an uncle or something would fill in like the father. But you say, well, so what? But that's not having sexual relations with the mother. But this much I will tell you. Evidence seems to be pretty clear that boys who are, you know, remember this, that most of the boys who are out on the streets wild and crazy, that's much more likely to happen if you don't have a strong father male type figure in your house. Now, I, you know, people can say, yeah, what are you talking about? And there are plenty of boys who are raised with, by mothers alone. But that seems to be just, uh, you know, and usually that'll happen. A grandfather will fill in. I'll tell you, my wife's first husband died when her kids were babies. And I didn't come along until they were much older. But her father filled in and her husband's brothers filled in. I'll never forget the first time we went. He comes over. We were engaged already. And one of the brothers comes over. I've got to take the kid shopping to get you a birthday present. She said, well, Dove already did it, did he? <laughs> you know, it was like this, right? He couldn't, it was kind of fun. In Jewish tradition, Passover is kind of like, has the same spirit as Christmas, right? The family gets together, and that's when you're all together. And uh, Not Hanukkah, that's, never mind. You get together, and the family, and I'll never forget, we, had, we were having what's called a Seder, the Passover ceremony. And sure enough, right in the middle, one of, one of her first husband's brothers pops in. Just to check on me. This is when we were engaged already. Just to check it out, be sure everything was okay. And if it wasn't, we, and see, he left his right in the middle just to check it out. Because she had always gone over to his house, right? So that, that's a common thing. And often, the, remember those gangs of boys, wilding they used to call it? Gangs of boys just going through the street, just committing mayhem. Most of them had, didn't have any male figures in there. Either. So it's not a rule, and it's hard to do. And women can be very strong figures for authority and morality, too. But... It's an interesting kind of a question. And much of what happened when traditional family patterns began to break apart and people came out OK, right? People began to question a lot of Freud. But the thing about Freud is he gave us insights into certain ways people are. He, he, whether he's right or wrong, this idea about certain things being deep in personality, this idea about needing about a lot of repressed anger and upset. This idea about needing, when we get to the adolescence, to find your way in life, and that it's a big struggle. Freud was the first one to describe to us how difficult adolescence was, right? Those things are major contributions. And the people who reacted to Freud, like Erickson, particularly Maslow, Right? They really, we really owe it to Freud that he's the one who brought up this idea of emotions and emotional things. He's, he's one of the people who told us that, just, just as Piaget told us, children intellectually are not little adults. Right? They're not little adults. They really function differently. They think differently. Freud is really the one who told us that emotionally children are not little adults. They really function and think differently. But the question is a very good one. It's a poignant question. It hits right to one of the problems with Freud's theory. I mean, I don't have a lot of sympathy with it, but let's go back to this. So you can understand what Freud is saying is that a man is with a woman. The minute he begins to feel intimacy, he doesn't have, all of a sudden his mother and the interview of her mother comes up and he gets out of there. Okay? Just to, just to complete this, come back to me. What happens... If even, even this kind of incidental, if you will, or non-emotional contact with a woman brings up Oedipal urges anyway, just even being with a woman in a sexual way brings up these urges of, oh, the Oedipal feelings come out my mother. What do you do? Think about it. You can't be with a woman without the Oedipal urges coming out. So what do you do? What? You can either abstain or how your sexual urge is going to be taken out. Come on, this is a this is a third grade problem. Go ahead. Do they become homosexual? That's for his explanation for homosexuality. You want to know what I think about it? But 
maybe minus, okay? But the homosexual community is very angry with Freud, but he's the one who said, look, this is deep in personality and you can't change it. You know, there were people who were, who were going to use conditioning to change people's, people's sexual orientation. Take someone who's homosexual, person loves chocolate ice cream, right? So it's a man. Put in a picture of a nude woman, chocolate ice cream. Put a picture of a nude man, give him an electric shock. People would do that. I mean, police. This is deep, deep in person. Freud's the one who told us that, and he said there's nothing to do about it. And if you're going to work, do therapy with, with people who are homosexual, that, that's just, you start from there. Now what? Right? And you understand, you, you must be clear to me now that Freud thought everybody needs intensive therapy. Everybody needs therapy. I mean, that was clear to him. Now, when it comes to women, let's go back here. The phallic stage is called the, ele uh, the Electra stage or the Electra complex. Does anybody know the story of Electra? I actually tried to look it up on the internet and couldn't find it. Come back to me for a second. It, it was the same kind of a deal where Electra unbeknownst to her, had sexual relations with her father. Freud's explanation for this stuff is not so good, but there's one big thing here. Okay, let's go to here. Here it comes. Penis envy. Girls have penis envy. Okay, why? Okay, now here's what happens. They come back to me. I, I have to tell you a story first. There was someone I was very close to. She was on faculty for years. I'm giving this talk. And she was waiting outside the door. I got to this, she bursts in, bursts in, she says, penis on me, she says, I have penis pity, in this tone of voice, right? She's screaming in front of the class, I was in the kiva. She's screaming out there, kiva, big room. Uh, that thing flopping around in front of you, getting stuck on you. I mean, she was very graphic, she was very, <laughs> she was very, because <laughs> obviously this is, you can see this, you can see why this explanation is going to tick off women. Let's go through it. Okay, women, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Women don't have castration anxiety because it's gone. So, and again, this is a little time, but the, the issue seems to be that in order, well, there's only one place you can get a penis when you're three to six year old. Your father, he's the only one you know who has one, right? So, you identify with your father in order to get it. He's got, for Freud, the source of morality. See, he's in a society in which women are staying at home and men are out there in society doing the jobs, etc., etc. So for him, the source of morality is the father. He's the one who's out there making the social rules, doing the social stuff. Although, he admitted women are the nurturers in society. There was no doubt about that. They are programmed to do that because of the oral stage. Okay? So it's identification with the father. That's where you get your values. Uh, but since there's a lack of castration anxieties, this leads to a weaker superego. Let's talk about that. Okay? Come back to me. A weaker superego. Okay. See, the boys develop their castration. They are so full of anxiety that they have this over, a fear that they have this overwhelming need to identify with the father to preserve their penises, right? Girls, it's gone. Too late. So they identify with the father to get one, but it's not out of this sense of tremendous anxiety. And he, therefore, he said girls had a weaker superego. It's an interesting kind of thing, and I, I've been thinking about it for years, and i tell you what I came to about a year or a year and a half ago. Almost every society, when it comes to the, the guilt, the conscience part of it, almost every society thinks that women are more moral than men, historically, anthropologically right? Men are full of war and anger and hate and aggression and women are kind and loving and considerate and nurturing. That's super ego stuff. That's not id stuff. As I'll tell you from my own tradition. In Judaism, traditional Judaism, there are two kinds of things you're supposed to do. You're so, there are certain things you have to do or not or things you don't do and this isn't coming on everyone. You know, you don't murder, and you don't steal, and you don't, you don't, uh, and you don't covet, and you honor your parents, and you don't put a stumbling block before the blind, and you, you leave the corners of your fields. If you read Leviticus, not allowed to pick up stuff that falls up the wagon or 
according to your feet, you have to leave that for the poor. That everyone has to do. But then there are certain things you have to do in order to remind you to do the other things. So as you look at numbers, it says you should wear fringes on the corners of your garments in order to remind yourself not to be tempted, not to follow the temptations of your eyes or the allurements of your hearts. Okay? Has anybody ever seen a traditional uh, synagogue where they have a prayer shawl over them, Jews, right? There are fringes on the corner, that's the idea. Some very traditional people actually wear, have something under their shirt, there's the fringes on it. Men have to pray and wear those fringes, women don't. Anything that reminds you men have to do, women, they don't have to do it. It's, they're all right without the reminders. Or so, for instance, there's a one day of fasting. There's more than one, but traditionally, there's one day of fasting. You keep praying about that, the Day of Atonement. You have to fast 25 hours. Well, you can't have kids fast, obviously. You've got to feed the kids. And the tradition in the literature says, the rabbinical literature says, you better let the woman feed the kids, right? <laughs> let the man go to the synagogue. The woman stay behind. She'll feed the kids, even though she's not allowed to eat herself, because she won't be as tempted. And then she'll come a little later to the synagogue. She doesn't need to pray as much as he does. And this is sort of, you know, almost every society agrees with. So I, I think, what the heck is this guy talking about? How can that be? We're sort of, you know, women didn't have a, but I think what he's talking about is ego ideal. In his society, women didn't have to find their place in life. It was no, get married, you have kids. Done. Even in our society up to a few years ago, if you didn't get married and have kids, you became a teacher or a nurse. Some sort of nurturing kind of an occupation. Done. Women, men had to find their way in life. And when he saw it, I mean, women just didn't. It was extremely rare. Something like Madame Curie. It was unheard of for a woman to do that. Right? George Eliot, a woman writer, she had to use a man's name to convince people that she was, you know, so that they would publish her stuff. And Madame Curie, actually, she worked with her husband. It was interesting that it came out that she probably was the leader of the team of the two of them. But he sort of had to be there to, to front for her. So... I think that's what he has in mind. Men had to find out what's my deal in life, what's my role in life, what's my goal, what am I going to do with my life, etc. Women had less of that. And I think that's what he had in mind. Once again, we see in modern society a lot of what he says breaks down. But it's an interesting kind of thing. You know, and I can't remember how he explains promiscuity in women and homosexuality in women, but it's, it's, it's based on the same kind of thing. Once again, it's not an explanation I particularly, uh, which I particularly agree. But Erickson, Eric Erickson, who came later, you see, in many ways for the Freudians, biology is destiny, right? If you think of the nature of a heterosexual sex act, women are open and receiving, men are thrusting and capturing, right? And they believe biology is destiny. The theory is very biological. And by the way, I've got to tell you something. Anybody ever been to Washington, D.C.? You notice all of the monuments to our great, our great leaders? It's the rotunda. Females, actually, right? These are the people who nurtured us, the founding fathers who nurtured us, right? Jefferson, Lincoln, the rotunda. He's the person who healed the nation. Lincoln was a war president, but we never managed him that way. Then George Washington, Feminine. The father of our country, bang, a giant phallic symbol thrust up into the sky. I gotta tell you a story. You know, we have these two obelisks going up into the sky at the front on Cullen. A friend of mine comes down, he's visiting me, and he knows about this stuff about, oh, UT and AM, and we're, you know, and tech and U of H always have, you know, are the second. He said, I can understand having an inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis UT, but two of them, right? I mean, I, I, Erickson, who lived into the 1990s, I mean, he was in his 90s himself, he ran into the feminist movement and all this kind of stuff, and he once said, I can't help it. When I give boys blocks to play with, they build towers. When I give girls blocks to play with, they build courtyards. Right? And you have to remember, you have to keep separate in your mind, I did a lot of research in this area, the nature of what they call masculinity and femininity is separate from your sexual preference, right? 
So whether you're heterosexual or homosexual, that's independent of being, you know, whether you're out there striving and moving and going, or whether you're nurturing and warm and loving that kind of stuff. And, and the Freudians themselves, and certainly the Neo-Freudians, they separated those two things. Right? As a matter of fact, the notion became much more important in the last 20, 20 or 30 years or so, what kind of personality you have when your sexual preferences, that people really, that sort of seemed to be, because that, that's really secondary to what, how you're functioning in society as a human being. Are you out there? And So all of these kinds of things are, are, are they're interesting kinds of things and things to look at, and it's just amazing. I mean, when they built the San Jacinto Memorial, also this giant phallic symbol up into the sky, they made a point of the fact that it was a foot higher than the Washington Monument. Mine's bigger than yours, right? Of course, now there's been subsidence, and it's actually lower now. So, but, you know, so, but it's these are interesting kinds of things, and and again, once again, all the kinds of things, the preferences that we have, sexually, but in other ways too, the kinds of ways we organize our lives, whether we're neat or whether we're not neat, whether we prefer this way or that way, whether we prefer to do things. And, and, and by the way, the whole thing about learning styles, you've heard all of that. Learning styles, different kids have different learning styles and cognitive styles. That all initially comes out of Freudian literature. Gardner, I can't remember his first name. Not the Gardner who did the different kinds of IQs, but you know, it comes out of Freudian literature. Later it was taken over by more learning theorists, but that comes out. The idea that there's certain ways, this idea whether noises bother you like crazy, whether you can block them out. Freud said all that is deep, deep, deep in personality. And you don't know why. But it's in there from your early experiences. Before we could, we got to do one more thing, one more painful thing. Adolescence. Okay, we got to do two things. But before we do adolescence, um, am I doing anything here? Right. Um, we need to talk about the latency period. Okay, here's latency. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. The latency period is about from 6 to 12. You notice again here. Get my picture out of it for one second. There it is. I put it in red for on purpose with two That's schooling, right? And Freud says, okay, put my picture back if you can. The latency period is characterized by libido and aggressive fantasies. The libido and the sexual aggressive fantasies that come with it is latent, although probably not completely gone. It's a part where it calms down. Calms down. Okay. Just come back to me for a second. Those of you who've had little kids will notice that during the Oedipal stage, the phallic stage, kids really are fascinated with their genitals. They'll slide in the middle of the floor. What are you doing? Stick their hands down their pants and start, you know, massaging their genitals. <laughs> Who's had kids who did that? Come on, admit it. They all do it, right? Your kids never did it? He's only 15 months old. Oh, just, you're in for a treat. <laughs> only 15. So what do you do? So you say, you know, it's not, the thing that they tell you now, say, it's okay to do that, but not in public. Okay? Then it dies down. Six and seven-year-olds don't do that. Interestingly enough, one of the most interesting phenomena that I always get, or I hear often from first and second grade teachers, and I get, as much as I disagree with this, there's a lot of interesting stuff. You'll get little boys who will run around lifting up girls' skirts, and they're seven, eight years old. You say, oh, what's going on? By the way, three years old, three to six is when they're also kids play doctor. Right? So Eight-year-olds don't do that. They play doctor. They're looking at each other, looking at each other's genitals, right? That kind of stuff. All of a sudden, the boys run around. Lift up people. They say, oh, my God, is he precocious? You know, he's already got sexual fantasies like he's adolescent. Wrong. He's back there playing doctor. He's eight years old, he's acting like he's three and four years old. And those kids almost invariably, the teachers will describe them as being very immature in every way. Except that one. Well, that one is immaturity. It's being stuck back, it's being fixated back in the Oedipal stage, or in the Electra stage, and there's some girls too, not as much. We should be in the latency stage. So let's go back here. The latency stage, there's a calming down of libidinal energy. The child demonstrates more self-control, stops rubbing genitals in public and stuff like that. And time is devoted more to intellect than to emotion, a time for learning cognitive and social skills. Okay, now, 
And that's about all Freud says about it, okay? He's not too interested in it. Come on. Freud, I told you a story about how can you tell a, what's the difference between a psychotic and a neurotic? A psychotic thinks that two, I got two definitions. A psychotic thinks that two and two is five. A neurotic th knows that two and two is four, but it makes her nervous. Okay, I got a better one. A psychotic builds, ca a neurotic builds castles in the sky. A psychotic lives in them, and the therapist collects the rent. Okay, right. So unless, <laughs> unless that's, I know that's a better one. That's why I tell a second. Unless you're truly psychotic, Freud says, I mean, you can really have terrible emotional problems and be fine intellectually. And he almost says it's like you got to pull back your body, sort of pulls back this this uh, this libidinal energy, so you have a time to. You have a time to acquire these skills. But the Freudians themselves have a different interpretation. There's a lovely book. Here, I'll give it to you. Here, I'll show it to you. called Summerhill. It's by A.S. Neal. You've got, I think Neal has, it's weird. I think the Neal may have an A in it. That looks right to me. A.S. Neal, I think it's like that. Anyway. If you're going to read it, it's a great read. It's just fun. Read the original. Because, okay, come back to me. I think it's Neil's N-E-A-L. N-E-A-L, yeah. Don't hold me to it, though, but you'll find it if you look under Summerhill and Neil. He ran at school as a classic Freudian school. He read it for disturbed adolescent boys. So for him, one boy said, I'm so angry. I just want to take these stones. And it was, this was in England. And it was the son of sons of rich, rich families. He said, I wanna, I wanna take these thrones and throw them through the dining hall window. Right? That's the is un unable to control his it, or it, it anger. And he said, fine, do it, I don't care, I'll just build your father. So the kid picked up the stones and threw I mean that's a throw through the window, he build the father. Right? But what he described, these are boys who are having trouble in regular school, so it's a boarding school, obviously, right? That he's got here. And he describes the school and the healing of the boys and the process that's going on. It's, it really, it's fun. I mean, Freud's stuff reads like Greek mythology, right? And in the end, how these boys did better, and all one boy was doing terrible, so he did much better in math when he got rid of certain anxieties that were due from his interaction with his father when he was young, blah, 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 this and that, right? I finished the book. I said, something is bugging me. I don't know what it is. It hit me two days later. There wasn't one word about what actually went on in the classrooms. Not one. Not a syllable. The whole premise behind this educational philosophy was if people are mentally healthy, they will be able to learn the stuff they have to learn. My assumption was a very traditional things going on there. That it, is, that it is anxieties and upsets and fears and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? This was great. And he talked about, for instance, he had one thing there in which there was a father who was so stern with his son that the son got paralyzed, right? We'll get to... Yeah. And finally he said, and I, and I refuse to allow masturbation. So Neil said back to him, well, you did it. You turned out okay. Right? And the father, of course, he caught him. Again, this whole thing about masturbation being okay, that's Freudian. This is a way to let off, a cathartic way to let off libidinal energy, right? It's okay. It's normal. You don't have to worry about it, right? That comes from the Freudians. But, so you can see that in the end, he's, he's, he forced this father to confront his reaction with his, with his son. They did some therapy together, and all of a sudden, the son improved a great deal in his studies. Well, again, there's this idea that emotional health is the key to getting this stuff done. If you're still fixated back in problems that you had in the earlier stages, you're not going to learn too well. Let me say one other thing the Freudians tell you, too. Look, by, your m personality is pretty much fixed in the Oedipal stage. Much of it is. And there's not much you're going to be able to do. If you're going to be an effective educator, you're going to have to take that into account. If there's a kid, who are the super neat freaks? Yeah? 
Who's a super neat freak who's been a teacher? Yeah? What happens? What happens? I'm going to ask both of you. Don't give the answer the honest answer. What happens when uh, a kid is a sloppy mess? Does it drive you crazy? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's irritating. Go ahead. It's irritating. Yeah, it it's irritating, right? I want you to go ahead. I had to. I tried to fix it. I tried to fix them all the time, and it just doesn't work. <laughs> That's right. It doesn't work. I want you to know that those of us who are anal expulsive, you get on our nerves as much as we get on yours. You irritate us as much as we irritate you. I can't. I had a teacher. She drove me out of my guard over how straight the margins were. What's the difference? It was a fourth grade. I can still remember it. Drives you nuts. Who gives a damn? And remember the, the paper with the red line? No, we don't use that. I mean, this was in 1954, and she must have been at least 100 years old. I mean, you know, this was the teacher. No ballpoint pens. You know, quill pens dipping in. I swear, we dip it in and write. We had a little inkwell. I made a sloppy mess out of it. So I brought a ballpoint pen. It wasn't so, it wasn't. She said, no, those things smear. I said, not as bad as I did with a dipping. It was crazy. Of course, it was typical. I remember her still name. It was Claire Beck, and I think she meant I dipped her pigtails once into the ink. I did it once. I was such a good boy, I knew I could get away with it. By the way, I saw her once years later. Her hair was very short. I was wondering if I did had done it to her, traumatized her. So that you know, that becomes you, you. You have to be tolerant of people's personalities, or you're not going to change them. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Here we go. Let's go back here. I knew there was something weird. LL. Whoops, 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 whoops. Two L's. That's it. So page 159. Thanks. You ought to read that book. It's a, it's a ton of fun. It's really a ton of fun. It's good fun. What the heck did I do here? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's come back to me. Okay. Now, finally, we get to adolescence, the genital stage. Actually, I put here puberty because I've been putting ages. But in fact, puberty is physiological and adolescence is psychological. When puberty comes, that's just the age, right? Adolescence begins. OK, see if we can get my picture in here. What happens here, and this is actually, I got this from, uh, not necessarily from Freud, but from Freudians, the libido attacks the ego. All of a sudden, the rational part of you goes bananas. Who's ever raised adolescence? I'm the only one? Oh, boy. It's tough. There is stress, anxiety, turmoil, and loss of confidence. Freud calls it Sturm und Drang in, in German. Uh, storm and stress is probably a good translation. Okay? You have this tremendous attack. There was somebody, who was that? Was it Horne? Talked about how this is a period where the, the libido was attacking you and you keep losing ego chips. And if you have one left at the end of this period, you can cash it in for a healthy adulthood. Okay? All of a sudden, you can't make rational decisions. You're overwhelmed by these these it urges. And they're genital urges by and large, but there's more than that. Also, now you're an adolescent, you've got your parents and your family and all kinds of crazy things are going on here. Okay? And, and most of you remember, some of you remember farther back than other, how insane this is a period, how full of stress and turmoil and upset you are. How there's a lack of confidence. I'll tell you a story. Let me come back to me. I saw Arthur. Arthur, first of all, Arthur reached puberty was 13 years old. I remember how he wrote a song called Artur is mature. He's so mature, right? We know he was, has a beard. We were all little boys. The girls all loved him. He was a star athlete. He made all state in football, basketball, and baseball. Some idiot. Five seconds later after the whistle blows, comes and pounces on a leg and destroyed his knee, and he never went to college as an athlete. Right? I mean, he was just, oh, everybody wanted to be Arthur. Years and years later, 
It was only a few years ago, as a matter of fact. I go back home, and I heard, and he, I heard he'd opened, he had a store. He was running with, he had chains of stores. So I found out, I found where he was, and I went there. It was men's clothing. I think he had two or three stores. There he is. And we start to talk over old times. He said, oh, was I jealous of you? I said, what? <laughs> you were jealous of me? How can that be? Oh, I was an athlete, but you were smart. So I used to hate it that you didn't have to study, you could still get good grades on the tests. I guess I passed and I never did study, right? I was a rotten student in high school, right? So I was jealous that he was a, everyone wants to be somebody else, right? You're, you lack confidence, and even when you put on the show that you have confidence, you don't. That was a very trying time, okay? So let's go back to the PowerPoint. Adult sexual feelings cause sexual and social conflict and are looking for your place and role in life. And of course, you know who's in the way? Your damn parents are in the way of all this stuff. Okay? Just wait, those of you who have pre-adolescent kids. Just wait. Okay? I have to tell you a story. Freeing yourself from your appearance is important, right? Come back to me. I have a friend. He has a daughter, 14 years old. She comes home 4 o'clock in the morning. She called everybody she knew. She went out of her mind. Kid walks in 4 o'clock said, I'm responsible for myself. I know what I'm doing. She had a boyfriend, or a, a, there was a group of friends. Actually, it wasn't a boyfriend, a group of friends, and one of them was 16. He's driving around, right? He has his license. I, I might add, not for the next six months after that was he driving around. His parents went nuts too, right? I can do it. Bah, 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 bah. She's freeing herself from her parents, right? I can be responsible for myself. Bah, 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 bah. She tells her mother, she's telling me the story. Her mother pulls out a letter that she had saved for 15, 18 years. The same thing had happened. She went off by herself, didn't tell her mother, and she wrote a letter. I'm going to think. Her mother waited 15 years to get the vengeance on her. It was more. 15, yeah, about 15 years to get vengeance on her. See, you did the same thing to me. She had that letter filed away. Typical. She didn't remember. All she knew was she was going frantic. Her kid's not home, right? So it's freeing yourself from your parents is a, one of the, it's the primary tasks of adolescence. So actually there are two primary tasks. To get these feelings of conflict in place, finding your place in life, and doing it by getting, but the, the key to that, that's why I put primary task, is getting yourself away from your parents and your parental domination, right? And defense mechanisms develop here in an attempt to try to keep all of this, this libidinal energy in place. Okay, so let's go to the PowerPoint. So these are the defense mechanisms that adolescents use. Get my picture out of it for one second. Adolescents use to cope with stress. One of them is, okay, taking flight. Okay, see if we get my picture back. Literally, or by isolating yourself. These are the kids that go in, they paint their room black, put on the records of some rock group called Death to Mankind, Humanity Sucks, <laughs> right? Put, my daughter put kiss pictures all over her wall, you know, kiss with those paint and their stung tongue sticking out, she knew, right? And hide in there forever. When I don't think she'll mind me telling the story. She comes in, he says, oh my God, oh my God, I lost my contact down the sink, oh my God, what am I going to do, oh, right? So I said, turn off the water fast. She goes back into her room and hides in her room. I took my tools, I took about the whole sink, right, I took about to the trap, this and that, I'm going through all the muck. I found the contact, I couldn't believe it. I knock on her door, I said, hey. I found your context. She goes, she says, oh, thanks. Slams it, goes and slams the door in my face, right? <laughs> so, right? <laughs> She's a great person now. She's just a great person. We're good buddies. But it just, right, that's typical. Runaways here, 
literally taking flight, running away, going, I can't sting my parents, I can't take them, right? Or emotionally running away, right? Oh! You go to church all the time? God sucks. Get that all the time. Or the other way around. Oh, you belong to this church? I'm going to that one. That's why there are youth groups in church. They're clever. Okay? You don't have to leave the church to run away. Just run into the youth group. Right? You can stay here, but we don't have anything to do with your parents. You're in the youth group. Okay? Not all, all kids do this, but this is a typical one, right? Let's go back here. Back to the Contempt for parents. Oh, yes. Mark Twain once wrote an ice article. He said, when I was 15, my father didn't know anything. By the time I was 21, I was amazed at how much he'd learned. Right? Parents don't know anything. Contempt for parents, asceticism, strict diets, rigorous exercise, refusal to participate in fun, quote-unquote, fun activities. This can happen a lot. This is, this is where anorexia and bulimia set in. Okay, Freud actually didn't see that, but Freudians have. Exercise regimens, you know what asceticism is, right? Refusing, this is common often among teenagers, joining right joining groups that, that do that endless running and all this kind of thing right there was an interesting thing about if you saw what was that movie with Tom Hanks where he plays the guy who looks into everything come back to me for a second uh, Gump Forrest Gump what it really was it was sort of a a thing about Forrest Gump growing up right he was like a perpetual adolescent Remember the time he takes off and starts running and running and running and running and running and running for a year and a half or two? Then one day he stops and so that's enough. I mean, if you saw it, it was sort of like a spoof on adolescence. Forrest Gump was the eternal adolescent. Oh, bumbling into things, too, so that's interesting. And finally, I'm sorry, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Sorry, I keep making you guys jump up and back. Okay, intellectualization, construction of elaborate philosophies, identification with idealistic movements. Okay. Who am I? What am I? Uh, come back to me. Okay. A sense of trying to figure out who you are. Okay. This is where I remember when I was in my 20s, I was a real idealist. I remember people telling me, when you're 40s, you'll, you'll take it easy. Right? No, never. But it happened right now. We were talking about the election before, I figured. Right? Somebody will win, somebody will lose. I like, okay, idealistic movements, philosophy. This is where kids get, this is why kids are, so, people like this are so prone to cults, are so, Freud says, are such easy prey for cults, right? Of various kinds, okay? Because you can come in then, you know, you can, you know, I have to find out who I am and what I am. Intellectualization of things. Go ahead. Gangs? Gangs are better explained by Colbert, but yeah, that kind of thing, looking for who you are. And we know looking for who you are and what you are. By the way, this doesn't go away. I still intellectualize all the time, right? These defense mechanisms, the one you develop earlier that we talked about in the previous stages and the defense mechanisms of adolescence, they, they, they stay with us. Right? There are even some people called the Gestalt therapists who say that defense mechanisms actually change as you get older. But gangs are the same thing. Well, you know, you, who's taught high school? All right, I'll describe a kid to you. The kid comes in the first, the first week of school with a bag, with a, a briefcase and a tie or very well dressed, I'm going to be a business major. Just before the Christmas break, the kid comes in with a torn shirt, blue spikes in the hair, right? I've got my new hair, right? Around March, kid comes back, proselytizing for some religious thing, right? Anybody ever seen? I mean, I'm making this up, but the kid like changes three or four times during the year. Oh, I'm a, I'm a, and, and often it's with a vengeance, right? Oh, I'm a great fan of this rock group. Three months later, you listen to that, you're an idiot. Well, you just listen, to it, right? This kind of stuff, real intense commitment. 
That's why, and you'll, you'll notice political parties, for instance, I don't know if they do so much, but they used to depend a lot on high, older high school students and young college students. Yeah, young college students, they do to be committed and active and go out and do it, right? That's why a lot of the explosions over things in society, right, happen, you know, a lot of the debates we have, are you allowed to do this on campus? Are you allowed to do that on campus? Should you do it, right? I have a right. It's because people are younger, and, they're, 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 and, but, and we have sort of an extended adolescence. But, but adolescence, I mean, it can, it can really... So all of these things are going here, and this is all a function. Adolescents often don't have the intellectual kind of capacity that college students do. They just believe. All this is a function of trying to find who you are and what you are in the world. Interesting enough, when we get to Erickson, which we will do next week, I believe, Erickson says, it's a little more complicated than this. It's really, this is a process that takes a while and that finding who you are and what you are is not just a one-time shot. Okay? Let me see what's going on here. Okay. Now, let's go, let's just finish off. I think we may finish early today, although, given the fact that I'm so oral and so loquacious, talk all the time, maybe. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Just for those of you, does anybody here want to be a therapist? Yeah, if you're going to take the therapy exam, if they ask you this before I think people are active or passive, say passive. Oh, say passive. The Freud thinks people are passive. Why passive? Okay, it, it, get me in the corner if you can there. Why passive? Thanks. Because Freud says basically we're pushed around by inner urges that we have over which we really have no control. We're not actively constructing and reconstructing. But the truth is, I'm not so sure about that. And the guy, Dr. Gay, who knows much more about Freud than I do, agrees with me. So that's why I have the question marks. There's a real sense that you're, especially with your ego, you're constructing your super ego, you're sort of moving your way through life. But Freud still maintains that we're fundamentally driven by inner urges over which we have no control. But the defense because of all this kind of stuff does try to give us an attempt to control. That's why I put the, okay. Now, development and learning, he's not interested in learning. All he's going to tell you is mentally healthy people learn. They develop, they require the skills done. His stages are maturational. His stages are clearly maturational, okay. It's not like Piaget where you construct them and you do it. They're just coming, boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. They're coming because they're biological in nature, just like adolescence is biological in nature. And again, what motivates people is this id, this pleasure principle. That's the basis of this theory. We're motivated by pleasure. Come back to me for a second. And the reason he says most of us have, we all have problems and emotions and moods and upsets everybody, is because in the end, this pleasure principle must be repressed. It starts from toilet training. You can't just go to the bathroom any place you want, whenever you want. You can't just do whatever you want whenever you want. We repress these kinds of things. And he's going to tell you extremism. So for instance, people who are absolutely rigid and nothing can change, he's going to tell you, this is different from being organized. It's got to be my way. It's because they're so terrified that their it is going to break through that they've got to have everything like this. That sort of compulsive behavior is about. Okay? Your, your basic life is trying to control these it principles and keep them in check. Okay, and they're over, and, and the id, when the id overwhelms you, it overwhelms you. If you talk to child abusers, right, you know something, I don't think I can explain to you offhand why, I couldn't give you a clear, coherent explanation of why some people are so attracted to children sexually. But, but my guess, but, but it has something to do, my guess would be it's something to do with the fact that you're, you're, there's a real tremendous fixation in the Oedipal, in the, in the phallic stage. And so when your genital feelings come, you're still playing doctor. Right, with little girls, right? They will tell you it is so overwhelming to them. You know, there was a time when they suggested castration for child abusers, and many of them said, do it! I can't stop unless you do it. Well, it's mutilation, and we don't approve of it, and all this kind of stuff, but, but we know it. That's why even after a sex offender has served, usually it's his sentence, they have to register, because you know there's a danger in it, right? But we have it the other way. This woman, I don't know if you remember this woman, with this affair with this junior high school kid, and she couldn't stop. She couldn't stop. 
even afterwards. They had a kid together. She tried to see him again after she got out of jail. I mean, she couldn't stop. So it just, and that's what Freud is telling you. Now, of course, the other way is to say, wait a minute. People are basically healthy. There's something that made these people sick. That's what Maslow's going to tell us. But Freud says, uh-uh. We're motivated by this overwhelming id principle. Okay? And once again, let's go back, let's go back to PowerPoint. Once again, Freud is going to tell us, like all of the... There are two threes. What motivates people should be four. Sorry. I'll fix it up later. How important is behavior? Freud is going to tell us we know nothing from behavior. Like all stage theorists, he's going to tell you you've got to understand what motivates the behavior. That's the key. What motivates the behavior? That's what you need to know. What's behind it? Let me, okay, come back to me for a second. The big criticism of Freud's theory is that no matter what happens, Freud has an answer. So we have three people whose parents, whose parents abuse them. Let's say whose mother, today says she did, mother abuse them. The first one says, you know, I hardly remember my childhood. Oh, repression. The second one says, oh, I love my mother. Oh, reaction formation. That's how, what I told you about with Moses and Monotheism, reaction formation. Your real feelings are so horrifying that you switch to the opposite, right? The other person says, the other person says, well, I kind of get along with my mother sometimes and sometimes I don't. Oh, you haven't, there's another one, but another defense mechanism. You haven't dealt with a thing. And the other person says, I really hate my mother. Oh, that's it, because you haven't been able to forgive her. I mean, whatever happens, Freud's got an answer why. So in the end, so in the end, you really can't test it. You can't test the theory, and in the, but he's saying, I don't care. Because two people can show the same behavior, and there's really something else behind it. The problem is it's, it's all ex post facto. You can't say, look, I see that that person having such and such an interaction at three-year-old with his parents, and this is how he's going to come out. You have no idea. It come out this way, that way, or the other way. So people have taken knocks at Freud's theory because it's not very scientific. But once again, he's telling us, Okay, uh, he doesn't care because he's an MD, he's not a research scientist, but once again he's telling us, look, you need to look behind why people are doing things. And people can, the same kind of, people can have very different reactions to the same kind of underlying problem. One person hates her mother, the other person loves her mother, but it's both from the same cause. And the, on the other hand, people can have two different, the same behavior, and it's for two different reasons. Two people say, I love my mother once because her mother was warm and sweet and nurturing, once because her mother was abusive in its reaction formation. So it becomes difficult. But once again, he's going to tell you, changing behavior is not the key. There have been people who have Glasser, those who want to be thin, Glasser's reality therapy is an extreme reaction against this. I don't care what happened with your mother 40 years ago or 25 years ago. If you're depressed, get up and get out of bed and go to work, even if you just sit there. Okay, I don't want to hear all this stuff about what happened. You've got to deal with the behavior and go for it, right? Before he's going to say, oh no. He's going to say, oh no. Got to get to it. Got to get what's behind it. And there are all the stories of Freudians who will tell you about how they're working with people on one problem, all of a sudden a phobia goes away. A person was phobic about snakes. Oh, snakes, phallic symbols, oh, right? A person was phobic about snakes, right? You notice that the story of Adam and Eve has fruit, which is the classic female sexual symbol, and a snake, which is the classic male sexual symbol. It's all in there, roiling around, says Freud. But he's going to tell you you've got to get to underlying causes. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Freud, as I said before, calls thinking the conflict-free sphere of the ego. Unless you become psychotic, he's not too interested in thinking. Okay? And of course, this is a theory of emotions. And I didn't fill this in because, here, let's come back to me. What Freud is really telling you is that the purpose of education is to create mentally healthy people. Okay? That's what we're up to here, up to here. Mental health, mental health. 
And the way to do that is to understand where people are coming from and what's going on. That's I'm adding. Look, you're not going to be able to be therapists. As a matter of fact, you shouldn't be. But that's what I usually do at the very end, but we're close to the end anyway. I'll tell you this right now. If a kid threatens suicide, unless you're the counselor, if you're the teacher, or if you're the administrator, you have to take it seriously. Now, kids will threaten suicide just to torture their parents. But some kids mean it. You've got to report it right away. Let me tell you something else. Kids who threaten suicide, just before they commit suicide, they seem to get better. They're a piece of themselves. They had one of the classic things, they'll give away their things. And they made a decision. They're at peace with themselves. The anxiety's gone. I don't have to worry what's going to happen next year, two years, whatever year I'm going. So don't think because, oh, the kid seems to have calmed down, the things are okay. The minute you hear a suicide threat, you've got to report it. That happened to me once. The principal tells me, I was just leading a discussion group in a school at 8 o'clock in the morning before I came here. And he, he said, and I did it every day just to remind myself who was in a middle school, what it was like, <laughs> okay? So she comes in through, so I don't think she means it. I said, either you tell her, or I'm gonna call her and tell her, I'm gonna call the counselor, tell the counselor. If he had told the counselor instead of me, the counselor would have contacted the parents and me, there's something about it. Okay, because so kids mean it. You cannot be the kid's therapist. On the other hand, if kids come to you and say, you have to promise not to tell anybody else, there's a line there. If you think the kid's in danger, it's tough luck. You should tell the school counselor or the principal, right? But, and in the end, you have to remember that in this ad period of adolescence in particular, kids may sink onto you, come, grab onto you as their ideal. How many people remember a teacher? You just love that teacher. That teacher was your model, isn't it? Nobody here? Oh, good, I'm glad a few of you. Yeah, some people not, okay? Okay, and if you hear things, if kids have problems, you need to do it. You, you, you need to refer to them. Let me give you a few, because this is the place to do it, a few what I would call outstanding examples. If kids come to you, and for whatever reason you're the confident, and they say, I'm a homosexual, and I don't want to tell anybody, you have to understand how difficult that, that is, right? When a kid, when an ethnic slur is made against a kid, that kid can go home and his parents are members of that ethnic group. Right? When a religious slur or a racial slur is made against a kid, the kid goes home and the odds are his parents are members of that group, right? If a kid gets called a fag, right, a kid, the odds are very high that kids' parents are not homosexuals, right? Don't try to deal with it yourself, but you have to try to get the kids some help. Go to the school counselor, do that kind of thing. I, I participated actually in a study with a, a guy who was, uh, he asked about counselors and counseling homosexuals, right? Kids would say they're homosexuals. And he did it, it was in the valley, a pretty traditional place, except for one or two people who were very angry with him. They all said, I'd like to do it, but I don't know enough. I'd like to help. And then they said, interesting enough, and I don't have kids really coming to me. A couple of them said, if the kids came to me, I'd find out what to do. So if the kid comes to you first, if you're the teacher or if you're an administrator or something, you really need to refer them on. Emotional problems are deep in adolescence, and they're hurtful and they're painful. And some of the stuff that seems so, so can you remember the stuff when you were an adolescent that drove you crazy, that seems so ridiculous now? Right? Oh, you got to have the right clothes and you got to act the right way and like the right group. How many of you pretended to like something that you didn't like when you were an adolescent just to fit in? Yeah, what did you pretend to like? You remember? Push it down, push it down. I can't think of me off the top of my head, but I can remember You're going along going no matter with what the flow. it was. Yeah. Do you remember anything specific? I remember that I pretended to like new kids on the block because all my girlfriends liked them. Liking the new kids on the yeah. When we get to Colbert, we'll, we'll talk about this some more, but it's very important to remember this. And if kids come to you with other problems, sibling problems or parental problems, right? My mother's 
doing this to me. Or my father. Most of it is just griping, but if you have a sense that there's something, you can either tell them to go to a counselor, or if you have a sense that there's something really bad going on, tell the counselor. All right, enough of that. Okay, so in the end, however, you, you need to be sensitive to, your, to the kids and to yourself. We had one teacher here. He said, I finally had to realize the kids just weren't like me. When you have a certain kind of personality, the opposite kinds of personality gets on your nerves. Right? It gets on your nerves. Quiet kids get on my nerves. Say something! <laughs> I tell people, the only thing I read, you know, George was afraid. I, the only thing I'd rather do than talk is argue. I love that. Right? He obviously had teachers who didn't like kids who talked up. Didn't you? God, he going like this. Yeah, because he was afraid. I don't care. Let's fight about it. Just like quiet people, certain people, talky kids get on their nerves. Yeah. Yeah, um, also, I don't like to argue, really. I'm not a big arguer. Right. Doesn't like to argue. I love to argue. When he said, I don't want to argue, he was getting, I said, come on, argue. He was, he was annoying me. Right? It's inevitable. But I knew, I knew that he's, he didn't want to argue, but he had something to say. That's good. Okay? So you have to be very careful of yourself, who you are and what you are. Not to penalize kids. Oh, I give 10% extra for participation. If you're an introvert, I penalize your grade. What kind of business is that? What are you doing? Go ahead, you want to say something? I thought something came to mind, didn't it? Right? What kind of business is that? And I don't like introverted kids. It's not that I don't like them. It's that they rub against, against my personality quirks. And we all have personality quirks. And we're not, and, and, and Freud tells we don't know why. Whether it's the way Freud says or not the way Freud said, what's the difference? They're deep in there. And in the end, we're going to see it with Maslow. You need to have an appreciation for people's differences. You need to have an appreciation for people's upsets. You need to have an appreciation for people who can do things differently from you. It was the Freudians who were the first ones who said, You've got to study the way that's good for you. Didn't, didn't I tell you here about, by definition, any book that tells you how to study stinks? Because it's saying, the way to study is to have my personality. Because this is what works for me. Really? What about the other people? Who don't have your personality. There are people sitting here who cannot imagine how you can possibly write something without lining, outlining it first. Am I right? And there are some people who are saying, the outline just gets on my nerves so much, I can't stand it. Just let me start writing. And then it'll come to me, and I'll get the idea, and then I'll cut and paste, and the outline will come to me. God, you can't believe it, can you? It never comes out the same. I mean, that's just like writing a rough draft. I don't write rough drafts because I end up changing the whole thing anyway. And so it's you, like You're doing the whole thing what anyway? It's just like writing a rough draft. I don't write rough drafts because I never follow it. I end up changing the whole paper anyway. That's it. Exactly. That's typical. It was pointless. What's the point? As I'm writing, I change my mind. My wife can't understand how I can do it. I said, I can be so damn cool sitting there outlining that whole stupid thing. Just write an idea. It comes to you. You stick it in there. And you have to understand that. Okay? All right. So what we're going to do next time, you will notice two things. Number about two things in general. Number one, specifically about Freud, it's almost all of it is with you and your parents, the kid and the parents. We don't have really social interactions. We'll get to Erickson. And another thing, all the stage series we've had so far, both Piaget and Freud stop at adolescence or puberty. And Erickson's going to come along and give us a nice, brilliant contribution. I'm going to say this again next week about talking about adult development. All right, I'm ending early. It's unbelievable for a person with an all personality like mine, an anal personality like mine. So let me start again. All person like mine who likes to talk so much, but that's how it is. See you next week. <laughs>